Hello and welcome to this audio service by the Rosendale Methodist Circuit. What you'll hear shortly is a recording of a service that usually takes place at Longhome Methodist Church in Rottenstall on Tuesday mornings at 10am. This is a live recording, so do expect some background noise, although we've tried to reduce this as much as we can. The hymns, unfortunately, have to be removed for copyright reasons, but we've suggested some links to versions of the hymns below this video. Good morning. Interesting day today. Yeah. Most Valentine's, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But um, it's also, as you see on that sheet, I've given you the the Sunday coming is the Sunday we think about the transfiguration of Jesus. So this communion is based on the transfiguration story. And also because of, um, while I've been away, I've been thinking a lot about well, how do you respond to the, um, to the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. And so all that's been going through my head <clears throat> these last few days as I've done my daily Bible readings and, uh, and all the rest of it and daily prayers. And there's got to be a response, hasn't there? You know, as Christians, we can't just sit back and say, hey, everything's going to be all right in the end. And if it's not all right, well, it's not the end. You know, that's a bit glib when all those people are suffering. So we're going to be thinking a little bit about that today, incorporating the transfiguration into it, but other things too. And some special prayers that have been requested by some people in Turkey. Um, you know the 24-7 prayer group called Lectio 365? It's an app you can get on your phone or your tablet or your f- computer or whatever. But Greg, Greg Smith, whatever is it? what's his name? I've forgotten his name, never mind. Um, the Lectio 365 is a daily prayer where Lectio Divina just means holy reading. And it's a way of reading the scriptures. You, you just read them, not, not to study them, but to hear from God. As you read them, you, you wait in expectation that God will speak to you through them. And uh, it's, a, it's a lovely way of reading the Bible. So when you open it, you think, what's going to happen today? You know, it's the case of, where, where's Jesus going to meet me in the scriptures today? And it's that expectation that uh, brings it alive as you open your Bible and think, what's God got in store for me today? And that's a great way to, to approach the scriptures as well, of course, because it is within the written word that we meet Jesus, the living word. So the words of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change. That has not been true for the people of Turkey and Syria. As the earth has quaked and changed, there would be a lot of fear, and there continues to be so. And yet, the psalmist is saying that even though that happens, God is still our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. And then he goes on, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city, it shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in uproar, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, see what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much that we can come to worship you, to bow down before you, to be still, 
and to recognize your presence with us. And we thank you that you are a God of glory, a God of light, a God who is awesome in power and majesty. We thank you too that you are a God of power. One before whom we will all one day bow the knee. But Lord, we so often forget that you are who you are. And we continue our lives in our own sort of merry way. So forgive us, we pray. Those times when we forget about you, we get so engrossed in our own issues, our own problems, even our own joys, and forget to share them with you. <coughs> Lord, we thank you that you do not leave us <clears throat> in our sin, but you come to us in Jesus Christ. You come to us as Lord and Saviour. We thank you that you are a God too of mercy and forgiveness. Lord, as we come to you today, we thank you for that love which we see in one another, reflected through the, the work of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that we see in you all that we can aspire to be. Lord, we thank you that Jesus, who was transfigured, became what we are so that we might become like him. So fill us again, we pray, with your Holy Spirit and set us free of those things that separate us from you. And set us free to be the people you created us to be. That each and every day we may walk with you in newness of life as you make all things new. We ask these prayers in and through the name of Jesus Christ who is our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. So, the transfiguration. It's a story we've read many times before and have spoken, I mean, I've preached on it so many times, I don't know how many, but uh, six days later, that's where Matthew starts in chapter 17. We must remember, of course, that the numbers in the Bible have been put there later. They're not part of the original scriptures, of course, the chapter numbers and verse numbers. They're just there to help us. So when a chapter starts six days later, you've got to sort of go back a bit and say, what happened six days before? And I'm sure you all know what happened six days before, when Peter declared that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Um, and then we get this wonderful story now. So six days after all that had happened, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. And suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. Amen. So Jesus takes his three closest friends, his three closest disciples, Peter, James and John, and off they go up this mountain. And there they have this awesome, quite literally, awesome experience. An experience which was full of awe and of fear too because of what they saw and what they heard. And Jesus is completely changed, completely transfigured. And that simply means, um, if you watch Harry Potter, the transfiguration classes, you know, where people are turn, turn themselves into animals and things, you know, this complete change. Well, Jesus didn't turn himself into any kind of animal, thankfully. He, he was transfigured by the Holy Spirit, by the power of God within him. And he shone, he shone. And it's a foretaste of, of what we're going to see Jesus in <coughs> at the end of time. 
You know, when you read the book of Revelation, you read there about this incredible figure that comes on the, in the clouds, shining brightly. And uh, Peter, James, and John get an insight into what Jesus will, how Jesus will look when we see him, when he finally appears. So his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. And there with him are Moses and Elijah. And Moses, the great, the great, the great, great leader of Israel. And, uh, and Elijah, the great prophet. The two, probably the two greatest figures from Jewish history. So if you'd asked a Jew at this time who was the greatest Jewish figure, they would have said without doubt, Moses, who led the people out of, ex out of slavery in Egypt into the freedom of the promised land and Elijah who spoke boldly to kings and, and leaders about what God was going to do so all the Old Testament is there if you like in Moses and Elijah the prophets and the priests and the kings and all the rest of it it's all wrapped up in these two characters and Peter of course wants to hold on to the moment he wants to keep it there he wants to you know it's like going on holiday isn't it you think oh i wish this would last forever <laughs> but you've got to get back home and you've got to get back to work and all the rest of it and uh, peter's like oh, we'll build a shelter we can stay here you know we can everything will be fine but jesus says no and uh, these guys disappear in this bright cloud that overshadows them and from this cloud there comes this voice this is my son the beloved with him i am well pleased listen to him and the father gives Jesus the, the encouragement, if you like, the, the words that enable him to go forward to the cross because it's from here that he comes down the mountain and off they go on their journey to Jerusalem and to the cross, which is why this is the Sunday reading before Lent starts because it's that turning towards the time of Jesus' passion. So Jesus is strengthened by these words you know God himself is saying this is my son my beloved listen to him the disciples fall to the ground in fear but Jesus touches them and says oh, how wonderful it is isn't it the touch Jesus reaches out and touches throughout his ministry Jesus touched all those who were fearful those who were sick those who were unclean you know who others Seemed, that's, this is just a little aside, I guess, in, in one sense. But, you know, Jewish teaching said that if you touch somebody who was unclean, you became unclean. So if you touch the dead body, you became unclean. You had to go and offer sacrifices to be cleansed again so that you could go and worship. If, you know, if, um, if you touched a, a, a tomb, you were unclean because the, the tomb was unclean. So if you, if you were clean, but you touched something unclean, you became unclean. And yet Jesus reverses all of that. Remember the woman who had been bleeding for 13 years and uh, she reached out and touched the hem of Jesus' garment. And Jesus said, go, your faith has healed you. Her touching him should have made him unclean. But when she touched him, it made her clean. Jesus reversed it. So that when those who were unclean were touched by him, he didn't become unclean, they became clean. So when Jesus touches our lives, our sin is forgiven, we become clean. It's wonderful, isn't it, how Jesus completely turns that all around. This incredible, awesome, transfigured, resurrected Jesus, the creator of the cosmos, comes into our lives and makes us clean. It's a nice aside, that, isn't it? That's what it's so encouraging it's so wonderful and you think sometimes you think when people are sort of <coughs> high and mighty and lifted up you know that they turn their noses up at those who who might be less than them and i think some people sometimes think about jesus like that oh he's so great and wonderful and full of light and love and everything you know just turn his nose up at me because i'm so there i'm not sure there's another word for that there but um and people get that in their head and, and, and miss out on what Jesus has to offer them. It doesn't matter how dirty, how smelly, how, you know, how sick, how distressed, how defeated we are. Jesus doesn't turn his nose up at all and comes to us 
and reaches out and touches us and lifts us up. So Peter, James and John saw Jesus in all his glory. Compare that with this in Matthew 26. After the Last Supper, Jesus and his disciples leave the upper room and go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, who are James and John, and began to be grieved. Jesus began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed. My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So Jesus takes his three closest friends <clears throat> into the Garden of Gethsemane. I mean, the other disciples are there, but he takes them to one side. And they see him not transfigured now, but deeply distressed, full of grief. He's in the depths of human sorrow. He's about to take on himself the sin of the whole world. So no wonder he's overwhelmed with that sorrow. He's going to drink the cup that he mentions at the Last Supper. The cup that represents his blood. Which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But more than that, this cup includes <coughs> reference to God's wrath. To God's judgment. If you read Isaiah and Habakkuk, you'll find their references to how the judgment of God's wrath is to be poured out on those who will not come to God, who turn their backs on God, who reject God. <clears throat> but there's good news even for those because Jesus drinks this cup in their place, in our place, so we don't have to face that judgment. And as we think of and lament the suffering in the world today, in Ukraine, in Turkey, and Syria, and so many other places, as we too go through times of deep distress, it's good to remind ourselves that Jesus understands. He has experienced everything that we face and more besides. This Jesus who was transfigured before Peter, James and John, who reigns in heaven glorified, is the same one who wept over his friend Lazarus, who wept over Jerusalem, and who was overwhelmed with sorrow in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as we hear and see what is happening in Turkey and Syria, in Syria and not forgetting Ukraine, of course, we read these words from Romans chapter 8. Well, not those words. Romans chapter 8 and verse 22. This wonderful passage that um, speaks of just so much. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labour pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs, with groans too deep for words. 
Paul, who wrote that, came from Turkey, from Tarsus in modern day Turkey. And uh, this is a bit of a noisy passage, really. There's a lot of groaning in this passage. I don't know if you noticed. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labour pains until now. The whole of creation is groaning in labour pains. And then in the next verse, it says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. We groan inwardly for, the adoption, for, for our adoption, the redemption of our bodies. And then in verse 26, likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs, with groans, too deep for words. So creation groans, we groan, and the Holy Spirit groans with sighs too deep for words. And I'm sure that, like me, you've groaned inwardly as you've watched <coughs> and listened to the news reports and watched the death, the death toll mount and the suffering increase with the cold. How do we pray from this place of deep distress? Well, Jesus prayed in the garden, didn't he? And prayed in such a wonderful way that God's will would be done in his life. And although that's a prayer, of course, that we all need to pray that God's will be done in our life, he also shows us that that crying out to God is so important. Is so important. Too often we pray simply <coughs> prayers of confession. Oh, I'm sorry, God, I blew it. Or we sometimes pray maybe prayers of thanksgiving. Thank you, God, for this beautiful day. But too infrequently, you know, we, 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 we don't pray prayers of lament. And the Bible's full of prayers of lament. The Psalms is full, you know, the th a third, over a third of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. God, where are you? God, what about this? God, this is happening. God, why is my pillow so, so wet with tears? <clears throat> and God likes that honesty. I was just listening to the radio on the way down and there's a, 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 a man on there talking about when his mother was murdered by the, um, <clears throat> an illegal organisation in Northern Ireland, one of the loyalist groups, about how angry he was and how he was going to get his revenge and things. But um, he's learned about forgiveness and about reaching out to those who caused his suffering. And he works for peace now and has been doing for many years. But of course there was a place for that anger and he said thankfully when I wanted to just get rid of all these loyalists and do to them what they'd done to us, you know, he said I'm glad that stayed in my mind, it didn't go anywhere else. And it's okay for it to stay in your mind. It's okay, you know, as long as you don't put it into practice. But God recognises that and so we lament. So. In the face of the suffering, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. It is hard to know how to pray, isn't it? But as I said, we've got some prayer requests. The Lectio 365, Pete Gregg, that's what he's called, says uh, we've got these prayer requests from people in the disaster zone itself, from fellow Christians. At the end of each prayer, there's the words Kiri Elison, which mean Lord have mercy. So when I say Kiri Elison, the response is, Lord, have mercy. So let's pray. God of compassion, you who weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn, hear the countless cries rising to you from Turkey and Syria today. So many lives have been shattered, so many hearts broken, and we feel overwhelmed. But you are a mighty saviour. So we ask you now to save. God of all mercy, have mercy. Kiri eleison. Lord, have mercy. King of kings, we pray today in line with 1 Timothy 2.2 for President Erdogan of Turkey and President al-Assad of Syria that their governments will cut through bureaucracy, leading courageously and granting free access to the aid agencies, seeking to serve God on the ground. 
And we thank you for the news just this morning that Syria is going to open two more entry points into their country for the aid organisations to help. God of all mercy, have mercy. Kiri Eleison, Lord have mercy. Prince of Peace and God of Shalom, in the chaos of this crisis we cry out for divine connections and a spirit of cooperation instead of competition. Would you supernaturally streamline the important relationships between non-government organisations and suppliers, churches and other agencies for the sake of those who are suffering the most? God of all mercy, have mercy. Kiri Eleison, Lord have mercy. Holy Spirit, you who brooded over the formless void and created order, protect and provide for those who are grieving those who are homeless, and those bringing emergency relief. We pray also for your church in these ancient Bible lands. Anoint your people at this time to bring good news to the poor and to bind up the brokenhearted. God of all mercy, have mercy. Kiri Eleison, Lord have mercy. And so we gather our prayers in the Lord's Prayer, asking that Christ's kingdom would come in Syria and Turkey, that those bereaved would know the Father's love, that daily bread would be distributed, and that those displaced would be delivered from evil. And so we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I don't know if you noticed, but the groanings in that passage from Romans 8 are the pains of childbirth. Creation groans in the pains of childbirth. It's a longing for all things to be made new. And that's right at the heart of the cross. Jesus died that all creation might be reconciled to God. That, uh, as it says in Revelation 21, this wonderful promise, he will wipe every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Behold, I am making all things new. Amen. On the 14th of February, 269 AD, a priest named Valentine was murdered in Rome for audaciously daring to preach the gospel to the Emperor Claudius and secretly marrying Christians who were being persecuted. There are several legends surrounding Saint Valentine. One of course is that uh, he used to cut little hearts out of parchment to give to those couples that he was marrying. And another story tells us how he, <coughs> Valentine, he healed the jailer's daughter. The jailer's daughter was blind and he healed her of her blindness. And then he sent her a note from prison. So while he was in prison, he sent her this note, which simply said, your Valentine, which was just his signature, really. And out of all of that, we have this crazy time where romantic love is built up and aspired to. But um, Valentine himself, was single and he was celibate. <laughs> How the world turns things around, eh? Yeah. His was the celebration of his faith. That's what he was about. He was about not romantic love, although he was obviously in favour of that as much as anybody else. You know, he liked to see it in, in couples who were getting married, but um, he was really all about the love of God and what that really means for people. And he was willing to die 
because of his love for God, but more so because of God's love for him. So, you know, we could pray for all those who are going to be disappointed today because they didn't get a Valentine card. We can pray for all those who have got a date, but it's disastrous. And we could pray too, probably more importantly, for those who are wishing they had a date or wishing that they had someone. But uh, remember too, that Valentine was somebody who was single and celebrated that singleness. And uh, that's so important because the most important love, of course, is that of God for us in Jesus Christ. And Pete Gregg, he writes a brilliant poem, a, a brilliant prayer for Valentine's Day, which I might share with you later. So let's share the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. We hope you enjoyed the service. You can find us online on www.rosendalemethodistcircuit.co.uk and also on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Please do let us know what you thought of this service in the comments below and you can always contact us by email at rosendalemethodistcircuit at gmail.com.